having said this is a great honor to have Professor Rejaknov on this program. And uh, uh, I think that we all know Professor Jaknov's enormous contribution to multiple fields, starting with linguistics, cognitive science, philosophy of mind, so on and so forth. So if I go about introducing his contributions, it will be a long time, but I would just kind of tell briefly uh, for those who are not from these fields, and we have audience that come from other fields as well. Um, Professor Jakendorf uh, has been uh, teaching at Tufts uh, 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 and is the co director of the Center for Cognitive Studies for some time now. But before that, he spent a long time teaching at Brandes um, linguistics and has been a student of none other than Noam Chomsky. And uh, Professor Jakendorf's main idea uh, in multiple books and multiple uh, other research articles has been the development of a framework called the parallel uh, approach. And not just to language, but more or less an oral framework to understand mental operations. So in that sense, it's pretty much cognitive. And we'll probably come to know today why he took that stand. And he has been continuing in many other ways. And most importantly, he also has contributed on the grammar of music with Fred Rattle and many other uh, uh, domains. And I remember your work with Barbara Landau um, understanding the transaction of visual information and linguistic information, the give and take. So it has been multidisciplinary in the true sense, and he probably would be best known as, as, as a leader who, whose work led to many other channels in multiple fields, cognitive linguistics or psycholinguistics or uh, philosophy, um, and broadly this field, mind brain sciences. And if uh, one reads uh, the papers that uh, he has been writing, or many books, uh, I mean, I remember Architecture Language Faculty and many other books uh, that he has written, they not just provide a, a critique of the classical approach, the TG approach to language, but also a move the field forward, linking them in. Uh, many, many ways. So that's fascinating to all of us who really want to know about uh, mind, brain, and uh, the overall uh, cognition with regard to the social context also. So I was just recently reading an article, a review article that I published in Topics in Cognitive Science as part of one of the lectures. And it was very clear that the, the precision with which he writes and the clarity with which he, he, he puts his arguments um, so I won't go further on that. I would say that it's an honor, absolute honor to have you on this program and thank you for kindly agreeing to speak to us. And two words on this program. It is an interdisciplinary kind of online program. And we have been calling uh, people of global standing in multiple fields who have spoken <clears throat> so far. And they have enriched our understanding and we get a lot of discussions uh, and we'll continue doing this. And this is done part of the, uh, not part of any particular university policy, but uh, University of Hyderabad is a uh, top research university. And we look forward to more uh, global contacts. And it is an institution of eminence um, now. And the Center for Neurocognitive Science is a center attached to the university, the School of Medical Sciences, where I teach. And my students who are uh, handling parts of this online program are involved. So without further ado, I would request Professor Jack and Dr. to uh, give his talk, and I request the audience to give their questions uh, till the end. Uh, then I ask this question directly or in the chat box as they would like to. Thank you, sir, and welcome. Okay, so thank you uh, for this lovely introduction. It's an honor to be able to speak to you here. I've never spoken to an audience in India before, so this is a new first for me. Um, and I have to warn you in advance that what I'm going to say is coming from the perspective of an old fashioned theoretical linguist. Um, the way I see it, most work in psychology and neuroscience is concerned with how and where and when mental representations for different mental faculties are processed in the brain. Um, and I'm sort of taking a different approach. I'm mostly interested in what the mental representations are how we want to characterize their form, their algebra, if you like, 
for their building blocks, what kinds of things you can build with these building blocks. So it seems to me that the form of mental representation hasn't been much of a focus in the cognitive sciences and neuroscience, I think with the exception of linguistic theory, uh, which is where I'm coming from. As you'll see, I'm trying to think about how this approach extends to other domains of cognition. Um, over the course of my life in this field, and it's now over 50 years, it's hard to believe, but that's how it goes. Um, I've been working on this approach that's gradually developed into a unified theory of knowledge of language and how it fits into the rest of the mind. And uh, as Professor Mishra said, I call this theory the parallel architecture. So the talk today is going to be sort of a potpourri of some of the big issues that I've thought about in this framework. I'm first going to sketch out how the parallel architecture applies to language. Then I'll talk about how semantics fits into the picture. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'll talk about some of its connections with two major cognitive domains, spatial cognition and social cognition. So the parallel architecture has three subcomponents that I've been able to work out in some detail. You can think of them as different departments of knowledge of language. Now, the first one is semantics. Um, conceptual semantics, which I've discussed in a number of books and many articles that culminate in my 2002 book, Foundations of Language. The second component has to do with syntax, and I, uh, this was work I did with Peter Kolokover, and we came up with a treatment of syntax that we call simpler syntax. Not simple syntax, but simpler anyway. Uh, and the third and most recent component is relational morphology. Uh, this is developed into a new book that came out in uh, February that I wrote with the morphologist Jenny Aldring from Leiden University. And this book is called The Texture of the Lexicon. Uh, the goals of the parallel architecture are pretty ambitious. Uh, I want to be able to characterize the mental representations that constitute knowledge of language and the human language faculty. And I want to do that in a way that lends itself to theories of language processing and language acquisition. Um, and um, it seems to me that the study of the different components of language have been really not talking to each other very much. I would like a theory that integrates phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, pragmatics, and conceptualization into a single overarching framework. And I wanna be able to integrate the language faculty into the rest of the mind. So that's a lot, but uh, we, it gives you a framework for thinking about the little details as well. So the basic premise of the parallel architecture is that language makes use of three or more independent combinatorial systems here, phonology, syntax, and semantics or conceptual structure. And they're connected with each other by interfaces that establish correspondences between the three structures. And a great deal of our knowledge of language is actually um, a great deal of our knowledge of language is encoded in these interfaces. And I should say that this approach differs from the dominant view in genitive grammar coming from Noam Chomsky. Um, Chomsky proposed already way back in 1965 that semantics and phonology are derived from syntax. So syntax is sort of the king of language. Um, in the parallel architecture, though, all these three com components are equally important. So a sentence is not just something that's generated in syntax. It's a triple of well-formed phonological, syntactic, and conceptual structures with well-formed links through the interfaces. The question is, where do words fit into this picture? You'll notice that um, there's no, nothing called words in this diagram. Well, the thing is that a word is part of the interface. It's a well-formed piece of meaning. I've notated that as cat in capital letters. And that's linked to a well-formed piece of phonology. Here, the, the phonemes cat, to spell out cat, and to a collection of syntactic features. In this case, it's a noun. And if we were in a language with grammatical gender, the syntax might say masculine noun, let's say. These three components within a word are necessary for every theory one way or another. The connection between them is usually notated with large square brackets like this. Um, but I'm going to notate their connection by co-indexing them with subscripts. So co-index one 
is going to indicate an interface link between the three components. This linkage has a direct interpretation in terms of language processing. It says that in language comprehension, if you hear the phonology cat, you can posit a noun that means capital cat in what you're hearing. That is language comprehension goes from phonology to meaning guided by the interface links. In language production, you start with a meaning you want to express, say capital cat, you want to say something about cats and you map it via the interfaces to a pronunciation with the phonology cat. So we've already made a little bit of contact with language processing, um, but I'll mostly have to skip the rest of that today. Now you might also ask, where's the grammar in this picture? Where's the rules of the grammar? Uh, the answer is that rules are stated as templates or schemas. They're pieces of semantic, syntactic, and phonological structure with interface links and variables where words have constants. So basically they're in the same format as words. Usually the grammar and the lexicon are treated as entirely of different types. But in this approach, the, the uh, rules are just lexical items that have variables in them. So here, for example, is a, a schema for the phrase structure of the English noun phrase. It's a piece of syntax that says a noun phrase can be made up of a determiner, an object, an optional adjective, and a noun. Now here's how we use words and schemas to generate a syntactic phrase. On the bottom left, let's see if my cursor will work. We see our lexical item cat again. Here is the lex bound, bound together by the subscript one. Here's the definite determiner the bound together by the subscript two. And here's the adjective fat bound together by the subject by the subscript three. And what you see over here is when we put them together following the template for the noun phrase, we have a noun phrase consisting of a determiner, an adjective, and a noun. And the noun means cat, and the adjective means fat, and the determiner means definite. And the phonology says it's spelled out as the fat cat. So we see the words are spread out, are, are, are spread out through the um, whole complex, and the whole complex is tied together with the subscript four that says, this is the pronunciation, sorry, the fat cat is the pronunciation of this meaning. Um, so this noun phrase scheme is allowing us to generate novel noun phrases like the fat cat. Next to it over here, now I've lost the cursor, oh well. Next to it uh, are the lexical entries for the, sorry, um, next to the, the, the entry for the noun phrase, is the entry for the transitive verb phrase. Um, and it generates novel phrases like count the cloudberries or something, or forget that alligator, any sort of silly thing you want. Um, but schemas aren't just used to generate novel expressions. They also have a second function. They capture generalizations among items that are stored in the lexicon. Think about an idiom like shoot the breeze. I don't know, is shoot the breeze part of uh, your uh, link your dialect. For those of you who don't know, it means sort of carry on an idle conversation, wasting time. Um, and the mean this meaning can't be generated from the meanings of shoot and breeze. Um, it has to be stored. So we have to store this idiom in the lexicon. That means we are not building it from its parts. Uh, there's, but their syntax is just like ordinary verb phrases. So we want to say that Although the schema for verb phrases doesn't generate these items the way it generates count the cloudberries, it motivates them. And the idea is that motivated structures in the lexicon are easier to learn and easier to process than completely novel lexical items. Um, to give you a, a little more idea of how motivation works, I wanna show you an example from morphology, the interior structure of words. So there's several dozen verbs that are formed from adjectives with the suffix en, like harden, blacken, widen, shorten, and so on. But this pattern isn't productive. So not every adjective of the right sort fits the pattern. For example, you don't have the adjective crisp um, giving you a, uh, a verb crispen, or the adjective loud giving you a verb louden. You have to know which ones exact, which ones actually exist. That is, 
you have to store these words in memory as an explicit part of your knowledge of English. But they're not just listed, they're motivated in memory by relational links to the corresponding adjective and to a schema that expresses the pattern. And that's what you see below. Ah, so here's the lexical entry for harden. And here's its meaning, it means become hard. And it's, con it's syntactically constructed from an adjective and a suffix. And the adjective is pronounced hard and the suffix is pronounced un. The whole thing is tied together by subscript six, but inside of that hard and the adjective and the pronunciation hard have the subscript five, which is the same as the subscript on the adjective hard alone. So we're saying that, that this adjective is the same as the interior of this verb. But and the meaning is, is um, become hard. And we have a schema that says become something or another can be expressed by an adjective followed by an affix where the pronunciation is whatever the adjective is pronounced like plus un. Now what, so that motivates the structure of become hard, of harden. Okay. Um, now, what I want you to notice is that, as I said before, harden is listed in the lexicon. It's not derived from these two things, but it's motivated by these two things. So the situation is a lot like idiom, and a great deal of English morphology is like this. So, what does this coindexation mean? I mean, it might be just a notational thing, but we want to interpret it psycholinguistically. We'd like to say the coindices are marking the ends of association lines like this. So the black lines are interface links. They're connecting two levels of the same word. Um, and they're also connecting the base hard in harden to the adjective and hard, the pronunciation hard. Um, the red lines, the red arrows, whoops, the, uh, the Somebody is uh, unmuted, I think, or the world is ending. I don't know which. Uh, anyway, the red lines, the red arrows are relational links. They're giving us uh, relations between different lexical items at different levels. Um, so this is sort of more intuitively what's going on. Uh, you could use this as your standard notation, but if you try to do anything halfway sophisticated, it turns into a mess of arrows all crossing each other in like spaghetti or something. So we'll keep using the subscript, but keeping in mind, they're not just a notation, they're standing for connections in memory. I'm not gonna trouble you with more details. If you're interested, you can look at the texture of the lexicon, but uh, let me sum up the outcome for the knowledge of language. So the parallel architecture involves relatively simple syntactic structures, very surface-like, uh, there's just enough syntax to mediate between phonology and meaning. They're not these giant tree structures that you see in uh, the minimalist program, the Chomskyan sort of approach these days. Um, the lexicon, we're seeing the lexicon is really central to what's going on. It's not just a list of exceptions anymore. It's a network of structures that are connected by interface links and relational links. And it contains the grammar as well as the words of the language. And it incorporates the idioms and all the other frequent multi-word expressions, cliches, and so forth. It incorporates both productive patterns like the transitive verb phrase and non-productive patterns like the en suffix. It incorporates both canonical patterns, again, the transitive verb phrase, which is all over the language, but also unusual patterns like we find in Examples like how about lunch or one more beer and I'm leaving. These are constructions that don't obey sort of the canonical pattern of English syntax, but we know them and we can record them in the extended lexicon. Um, and so, and in addition, a lot of the work that's traditionally done by syntax is done by the interface between syntax and semantics. So we can think of syntax as giving you ways to say things. Let's move on to what the theory has to say about semantics. Um, I'm not gonna give you anything substantive. I'm just gonna talk about some requirements on any theory of semantics that wants to put meaning into the mind. 
So first, the theory has to be expressive enough to assign distinct meanings to all the words and idioms in the language. And there are tens of thousands of them. So it's gonna be a huge undertaking. Second, items that are intuitively related have to have semantic structures that are connected to them by relational links. So for example, the intransitive verb break in the sentence, the window broke, should have a meaning related to that of the transitive verb break in the sentence, John broke the window. And it does have a related meaning. The transitive break is the causative of intransitive break. So we want to say there's a relational link between those two words. Next requirement is compositionality. We want it to be possible for the meanings of lexical items to be combined into the meanings of phrases, sentences, and discourses in the way that we saw with the fat cat. Another requirement is translatability. We want words and sentences that mean the same thing in different languages to have the same or at least similar semantic structure. The theory also has to provide an account of inference. So if somebody says, do you Beth owns a dog? You can infer that Beth owns an animal. Or if somebody says to you that Bill entered the room, you want to infer that Bill ended up in the room and so on and so forth. Now, a very important requirement on a theory of semantics is that it has to provide an account of reference, the relation of linguistic expressions to the world. Now, the philosophical tradition wants to co connect language to truth in the real world. The conceptual semantics treatment instead con connects language not to the real objective world, but the, the world that the language user understands, the world as the language user construes it. So we're putting the theory of semantics explicitly within psychology, how we humans understand the world. We can only refer to things that we can conceptualize. If you can't conceptualize it, you can't talk about it. And what you can conceptualize can even include things that we know don't exist in the real world, things like unicorns and Sherlock Holmes. These are things that are in the world that we construe, but as part of somebody's imagination. Another very important requirement on semantic theory, if we want to put meaning in the mind, is that meanings have to be learnable. Language learners have to be able to figure out and store the meanings of these tens of thousands of lexical items. Again, words and idioms and schemas. And they have to be able to do this on the basis of linguistic and non-linguistic input. Well, all of these requirements are addressed in conceptual semantics. And uh, I can't say that any of them are completely solved, but we seem at least to be on the right track. So now with the parallel architecture and its semantic component in mind, I wanna to turn to another kind of knowledge that interfaces with conceptual structure and that's spatial cognition. There's a very important question for cognitive science that hasn't been very prominent in the literature, but it's been made forcefully by John McNamara, by um, George Miller and Philip Johnson Laird in their book, Language and Perception and by me in my paper on Beyond Zebra from 1987. And the issue is how do we talk about what we see? Most work in semantics ignores the, the process of actually perceiving something and talking about it. They just talk about reference to the real world. Uh, but now we have to talk about it psychologically. How do we see things that we talk about? So let's think about how this has to work. Preliminary answer is that there has to be some sort of informational conduit that connects language to the visual system. And from the point of view of linguistics, one way of thinking about this question is, what does the visual system need to generate in order for language to say the things it does about what we see? Or to put it more bluntly, what do we see such that language can talk about it? So this presents challenges for theory of vision, which is mostly concentrated on object perception. To meet this challenge, we need some sort of an object-centered volumetric representation of objects along the lines proposed by David Marr back in the 1980s. For instance, if we talk about a cat, what we're talking about is independent of its distance, our point of view, and the lighting of the room. That is, there's a kind of mental representation that observes what psychologists call object constancy. And I'll call this representation spatial structure. 
it includes not just the front of objects, the part that you can visually see, but it includes also the backs of objects, the parts you can't see, parts that are occluded, that are behind something else, even things that are totally occluded, like the cat behind this bookcase, right? If you imagine, if you look at this and I tell you there's a cat behind the bookcase, you understand that in spatial terms. Um, the spatial structure also has to encode our understanding of hollowness, for example. We can't see the insect inside of an object like a balloon, but we know it's empty. Now, spatial structure can't be just a visual representation. You can determine the size and shape of objects and their spatial layout just by handling them, by touching them with your sense of touch. This is the sense called hapsis, or you're understanding things haptically. And in addition, there's an object for which you have a special way of determining its position and orientation, namely your own body. There are several sensory systems that serve this purpose in your muscles and joints and inner ears. And these two give a picture of where you are in space. And it's necessary to integrate this picture with spatial structure in order to plan and execute actions. So how does this hook up to language? There has to be a partial correspondence between spatial structure representations and conceptual structure representations. And these will be encoded in terms of interface links. That is, it's that connection isn't so different from the interface links between conceptual structure and syntax. So a word that denotes a spatial entity like cat has not, a, not just a conceptual structure, syntax, and phonology. It also has a piece of spatial structure that says what cats look like. And so these interface links are, are what make it possible for us to talk about what we see. This approach also allows us to locate the language faculty in the larger context of the mind. Here's kind of a grand diagram of language and its role in the rest of the mind. Let's see if I can get my cursor to work. No, uh, here it is, yes. At the top here, you see what I gave you as a parallel architecture before, phonology connected to syntax and connected to semantics, conceptual structure. Here, auditory signals feed the phonology in language comprehension. In language production, phonology feeds vocal tract instructions. On this end, conceptual structure interfaces with spatial structure. They're talking to each other. And spatial structure is um, connected with retinal input through the visual surface. The visual surface is the part that's actually visible to you from your point of view. The, it's it's uh, interacting with haptic input, which is giving you the way objects feel. It's interacting with proprioceptive input, which is giving you how your body feels. And all of this connects with, um, so all of this ultimately connects with conceptual structure and therefore to language. So we can think of this part of the mind as the sensory motor part. We can think about this part as perception, and we can think of this part here as cognition or thought. So this is giving us a whole layout for the way for a way to think about the organization of the mind. Given this arrangement of components, the relation between language and spatial structure has to be stated in terms of a correspondence between the two representations. You can't derive spatial representations from syntax, um, and especially since in evolutionary terms, spatial structure was around a, long, a lot longer than language. So you can delete the language parts of this, the phonology and the syntax, and get what's a believable architecture for a primate. So monkeys certainly have spatial orientation. And they do, and they get it through retinal input. They certainly have a sense of touch. They certainly have proprioception. They certainly have action planning and motor instructions. What they don't have is phonology and syntax. So let's think a little more about what else language tells a spatial structure has to include besides objects. We can talk about parts of objects like the cat's head and eyes and ears and legs and tail. So these parts have to be represented discreetly in spatial structure so we can identify them in the cats that we see. A less obvious uh, case is what I call negative parts. These are things like holes and cracks and dents and caves. They have shapes too. But instead of these things being added on 
to the object like a tail on a cat, you can think of them as things that are carved out of the body of the object, taken out, pulled out. So it's the, sh the, the shape that's, that's defined by what's outside of it instead of what's inside of it. Another important requirement of spatial structure is that it needs abstractions from the shape of particular cats. That is some sort of schema that serves as a stored category of, of cat appearances, something like that. And a single image is too specific to represent what you might call a generalized cat. We also have to encode an object's affordances for action. So we talk about the cat stretching or crouching or pouncing. Notice using these manner of motion verbs. And we can identify these manners in a cat that we're looking at. So there has to be some conduit, again, through spatial structure from what the cat is doing to what we call pouncing or crouching. Uh, we need a description of spatial layout. So we talk about the cat in front of the bookcase or behind the bookcase or under the bookcase. That's the relation between two objects. We have to be able to pick that out from the, from the visual array. And so that's a natural thing to go in spatial structure. And finally, we need a description of motion in space. So the cat runs out the door and chases a mouse and carries the mouse into the house. All of these things about motion and trajectories have to be picked out of the visual field. So these are things that we talk about, so the vis vision must be picking them up. How do we formalize all of this? David Marr's 3D model and Irvin Biederman's geons were preliminary attempts back in the 1980s. I don't know that there's been a lot of work since then in this sort of explicit form. Uh, I guess there's a lot of work in AI these days, but it's a really different conception of what cognition is like. Um, and Marr and Biederman were just talking about objects and we've already enriched the need for what the visual system can provide for high order vision. Now we've put all this richness in spatial structure and we might therefore wonder who needs conceptual structure at all? I mean, couldn't we just do, do every, run all of our semantics off spatial structure? Well, no, you couldn't and here's why. Uh, conceptual structure is an algebraic sort of feature-based representation. It's kind of like logic. Um, um, but so it has functions and arguments, but it can't do details of shape and spatial layout. These are the business of spatial structure. So, but there are things that conceptual structure can do that spatial structure can't. First of all, conceptual structure can encode the type token distinction, the difference between an individual, a token, and a category or a type. Objects that you perceive are all tokens, but objects in memory could be either tokens or types. So if you say, that's my cat pointing to something, you're comparing an individual that you're perceiving to a token individual in memory, namely my cat. But if you say, that's a cat, you're comparing an individual you perceive to a category in memory. Now the individual in memory and the category in memory both have the shape of the same sort. That is, they both look cat-like, but the difference between them has to be an algebraic feature of this, just of the sort that conceptual structure is good at. For another case, uh, conceptual structure has to encode taxonomic relations, say the relation between spinach and vegetable Vegetables don't have canonical shapes. Think about spinach and tomatoes and carrots. They're all vegetables. So the fact that they're all vegetables can't be encoded in terms of what they look like in spatial structure. Rather, we want a conceptual structure relation, something like X is a type of Y. And the same thing applies to, say, furniture, which includes lots of objects of disparate shapes like tables and chairs and lamps and so on. Another domain where spatial structure isn't of much help is quantification and negation. What does every cat or no cat look like? There's no way to encode every or no in spatial structure, but the traditional treatment of logical quantification and negation can be built fairly naturally into conceptual structure. So similarly, spatial structure alone can't distinguish actual cats from possible or hypothetical cats. If I say, suppose, there's a cat behind the bookcase. 
how do we say that cat is imaginary? Well, the, that's something that conceptual structure can invent a feature about that distinguishes them, things that are that we conceive of as real and things that we conceive of as imaginary. So the conclusion from all this is that our spatial knowledge is shared between the geometrical representations encoded in spatial structure and the algebraic representations encoded in conceptual structure. And the two interweave in complex ways. As I, I hope I've given you some of the flavor of that. So now for comparison, I wanna to turn to a different domain of knowledge, social cognition. What do I mean by social cognition? Well, it's a domain of cognition that pertains to an organism's ability where the organism is a human or a social animal. So the organism's ability to interact socially with conspecifics, that is with individuals of the same species and to understand their interactions with each other. And in the case of humans, I wanna understand their interactions in the context of social institutions like norms and laws and so forth. I think this is a core, a core component of human cognition alongside spatial cognition. We need spatial cognition, uh, spatial structure to identify the people who we're looking at, interacting with and their expressions and their gestures. But the most interesting part of uh, social cognition is conceptual rather than perceptual. It's stuff that you can't see, it's abstract. Let me list some of the issues in social cognition that are not perceptual. Cognitive science is focused pretty much on theory of mind as what social cognition is about, how you understand what other people are thinking, but there's a huge number of other issues. So, one, so including intention and joint intention, where joint intention is collaboration or cooperation. You have to understand that you're doing things together. Uh, then there are issues that uh, anthropology talks about a lot, kinship, group membership, dominance, alliance, friendship, enmity. These also turn up in the primate literature. Um, and then we get into moral philosophy and moral psychology, the understanding morals and customs legal philosophy, rights and obligations, a relation to the natural and supernatural world. That's getting us into issues of religion and psychology of religion. So you can see social cognition encompasses a huge amount of human endeavor. Uh, I'm gonna just talk about one little issue that illustrates how rich and complex this domain is. This is the logic of reciprocity, retaliation and restitution. And we're gonna see it in the context of this little preposition for one of its many uses. So <coughs> it has to do with performing an action in return for an action. So if I say, Ozzy cooked Harriet dinner for fixing his computer. This tells us Harriet fixed Ozzy's computer and Ozzy is doing something nice to Harriet in return. He's cooking dinner for her. The negative version of this is Ozzy slashed Harriet's tires for insulting his sister. So Harriet has insulted Ozzy's sister and that's something um, she's done that's bad. And so Ozzy is doing something bad to her in return, he's punishing her. In order to understand this, we need, at, first of all, a notion of an action being good for someone, benefiting them or being nice to them versus doing something bad to them, harming them. But we also need to understand this, that the values of the actions have to match in valence, in goodness versus badness. So suppose I say, Ozzy cooked Harry a dinner for insulting his sister. Now he's doing something nice in return for her doing something bad, or else he really wanted her to insult his sister so she was doing something good for him. Um, it's kind of odd, isn't it? We take the negative, negative premise, Ozzy slashed Harriet's tires for fixing his computer, you get the idea that Ozzy didn't want his computer fixed. So it was bad that she fixed his computer. Alternatively, it doesn't make much in, in the, the idea that he's doing something bad to her in return for her doing something good just doesn't make sense. Not only do they have to match in valence in goodness or badness, they have to match in magnitude, the degree of goodness or badness. So if I say Ozzy cooked Harry a dinner for saying hello to him, 
she's done something rather minor and he's doing something rather major and he's sort of overdoing his uh, gratitude. If we say, Ozzy cooked Harry dinner, the same action, for rescuing all his relatives from certain death, now she's done something really terrible and what he's do doing is really minimal by comparison. So again, this is kind of weird. Let's look at negative actions. Ozzy slashed Harriet's tires for eating too little at dinner. She has this minor infraction and he's doing this really bad thing to her. That's weird. Um, but if I say Ozzy slashed Harriet's tires for murdering his family, now what he's done is negligible in comparison to what she's done. And so it's weird again. So the overall principle is if you act in return for some action of mine, your action is going to be as good for me as my action was for you, or as bad for me as your action was, as my action was for you. Okay, I hope you got that. Because so the positive version of this is, is what's called in the evolutionary psychology literature, reciprocal altruism. You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours or and so I'll, scr I'll scratch yours. Or we'll put it as one good turn deserves another. We have this little aphorism that expresses this principle of reciprocity. And I wanna just point out for people who've been reading the uh, evolutionary psychology literature, um, this is not um, what they mean by reciprocal altruism always because they talk about it. Dawkins, for example, talks about you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. That's an offer of joint action and saying, if you do this, I will do that. The reciprocity I'm talking about is you've done something nice for me already, so I think I'll do something nice for you. That is, it's displaced in time. The negative version of this is retaliation or retribution. And again, for this, we have um, the aphorisms, the, fun, the punishment fits the crime where the punishment is something bad done in return for something bad, namely the crime. And an eye for an eye, the damage should be equal in uh, negative affect. The third member of this um, group of predicates is restitution. So if we have something like Ozzy cooked Harry a dinner to make up for having embarrassed her in public, Ozzy has done something bad to Harriet. He's embarrassed her in public and Harriet, and he's doing something good to make up for it. So this is a little different from the other configuration. Or Ozzy brought Harriet flowers. He's doing something nice to make up for forgetting her birthday, which is something not nice. And the magnitudes again have to match. So if Ozzy gave Harriet his vast fortune to make up for forgetting her birthday, He's doing something completely bizarrely out of line. It's much too, much too great in value, much too great in magnitude for what he's done bad to her. Conversely, the other direction, Ozzy brought Harriet flowers to make up for killing her entire family. <laughs> he's um, done something really terrible and he's, he's trying to make up for it by a rather minimal gesture. So the overall principle for restitution is if I act in restitution for having done something bad to you, this act of mine is as good for you as my original harmful act was bad for you. So here we have equal magnitude, but opposite valence. This one, you might say, well, re uh, reciprocity and retaliation formed a nice du dual relationship why isn't that the case for restitution? And you look, you try to construct an example and saying you get something like Ozzy slashed Harriet's tires to make up for having cooked her dinner. He's doing something bad to make up for having done something good for her. This is really bizarrely weird. And I think of it as sort of conceptually ungrammatical. So, so far, I've characterized these relations of valence and magnitude between the two actions involved in reciprocity, retaliation and restitution. But it's not just that, there's morality involved. The action that's performed in return has a moral value. So if I do something nice to you, a positive value to you, then it's morally good 
for you to reciprocate, to do something nice back to me. And people will say, oh, isn't that nice? He reciprocated, you reciprocated. Um, they'll think better. They'll think better of me in this case because I'm doing something of positive value. Um, and then restitution works like this: if I do something of negative value to you, then it's morally good for me to do something in restitution. So I'm doing something to make up for the bad thing I've done. And these are special cases of of more general principles. It's good to be nice to people and bad to be mean to people. So we're getting into into senses of fairness and justice. Now, the third possibility is I do something bad to you, then what happens? What are your moral, uh, what are the possibilities for action and their moral judgments? So I've done something bad to you, then one possibility, it's morally good for you to re retaliate. So I've done something bad to you and you do something bad back to me and people will say, oh, that was the right thing to do. He really deserved what he got. And this gives us what have been called in the literature, honor cultures, where there's a lot of fighting back and forth and feuds, getting back at people for doing things. Second possibility is I do something bad to you and it's morally neutral for you to retaliate. So you retaliate and people say, well, okay, he retaliated. That was probably what he wanted to do and that's okay with me. Um, the third possibility is that it's morally bad of you to retaliate. So we have an aphorism for that, which is turn the other cheek. So I do something bad to you and you retaliate and people say, he really shouldn't have done that. That wasn't the right thing to do. He should have just let it go. So we get cultural differences here or differences based on what particular actions they are. And these are things you have to learn as part of learning your culture. So with all of that, it's time to sum up. Um, going back to conceptual structure, I've tried to show you that it connects with language via syntactic and phonological structure. For spatial cognition, conceptual structure also connects with spatial structure, which is derived through perception in multiple modalities, vision, hapsis, and proprioception. And, and this connection between spatial structure and conceptual structure is what enables us to talk about what we see. For social cognition, you need certainly need elements of spatial cognition in order to identify the ind individuals you're interacting with and to read their expressions and their gestures. But social cognition also has this rich internal logic that goes on in terms of conceptual structure and is really totally abstract. And I've tried to show you some of its depth just in trying to explicate this little preposition for, we need values that have valences plus or minus and magnitudes better or worse. Um, we need benefits and harm. We need morality. We need cultural differences in morality. And what's interesting is that we've been able to come up with the meaning of traditional aphorisms in terms of this somewhat formal treatment of, uh, of reciprocity. And I think these, as I've said earlier, these two domains of human cognition, namely spatial cognition and social cognition, arguably, first of all, um, if you understand those two, you understand a huge amount of human understanding. And furthermore, spatial cognition is arguably, arguably present in our primate relatives. And so is social cognition. If you read any of the literature on primate social cognition, it's very, very interesting. And it's not as rich as in humans, but many, many of the same elements are present. So we now are in a position to ask evolutionary questions. What did evolution have to add to the primate conceptual rep repertoire in order to get us so on that gigantic note, I will stop and say thank you very much. Thank you, Ray, for a very rich and uh, incisive treatment of uh, many issues. I was pretty much taken aback with those examples uh, from the moral domain. Uh, and there are many things uh, to ask, but uh, 
you know, I've been thinking uh, a few broad issues. I mean, considering the audience that we have got here, um, the, the social cognition uh, or you know the dynamics that happen in particular cultures, how do they directly influence the workings of the events? Uh, I mean, the components of parallel architecture. If that is how. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean the the. Um domain of social cognition is going to be some large subpart of conceptual structure. Uh, cultural differences will be very much like linguistic differences. There are different ways to configure the parts. Different parts will have different weights on them. There will be certainly one of the things you have to learn, it's sort of like a social vocabulary, is what kinds of things are good and what kinds of things are not good. So in some cultures, you know, 200 years ago, slavery was okay. Now we think it's morally bad. Uh, a lot of mores have to do with who you're allowed to sleep with, who you're allowed to marry, who you're allowed to do business with. And those are things you have to learn very much like rules of grammar. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the biological realization of the architecture, uh, what, to what extent do you look at the brain? I mean, of course, there are I, yeah. I mean, the brain data, like fMRI and ERPs and so on and so forth. It's complicated architecture, and, and you could get lots of data if you try investigating its component and interaction. I, mean, I want you to take on this, the brain part of it. Well, um, as I said, my business is in discovering mental representations, not so much studying okay. brains. And a lot of the work on brains is telling you where things are located and when they take place, but they don't tell you what the information is that's being processed. And I worry about this because we don't even really know how the neurons do something as simple as a speech sound. Hmm. Um, and we'd love to know, and you know, we're waiting for, and, and sort of, uh, we don't have a theory of what neural computation is like beyond saying there's spikes. And there's, you know, uh, uh, um, oh, I'm forgetting the term, uh, uh, potentiation of synapses right. and things like that. And how those turn into the, you know, the word pig or the perception of the word pig as opposed to saying this is where you are um, processing phenology. How do, where does the particular word fit into this? This is also true, I think, in face recognition. They, you know, uh, Nancy Canwisher, who I believe spoke in your yes. series some time yes. ago, is uh, has, you know, built a whole reputation on finding the uh, face area in the brain. Yep. But what? How does that area do what it does? How does it encode faces? We don't know. We just know that it encodes faces. So that, yeah. that's the um, a major gap in our understanding, being able to connect the brain to the, the work that the brain is doing. The, yeah, as Lawrence Barcelow might have said, the perceptual grounding problem, how, how the knowledge is grounded through the biological strata, even if we get the data for the firing rate. Yeah. Activity in large cortical sites. Uh, Should I stop sharing so I can actually? Yeah, see yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, yes. Why don't I do that? I can find my uh, uh, cursor. Yes, the, the go. green. Yeah. Yes, good. Um, that, that's better. Uh, I have two more questions and then I will uh, take some. Uh, okay. How do you see or where do you see common designs? Uh, I mean, uh, your your approach and many others' approach is moving in the next 10, 10, 10, 20 years. Where where are we with regard to this question? As a general theory of mind. Yeah, this uh, is very hard to. <laughs> very I mean, hard you could to attempt a very simple version of this. I know it is. It is right. a broad... It's very it's very hard to predict. All I can tell you is I know what I would like to see. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, um, with some collaborators, I've been able to think about how. The representations are processed, so we're getting down a little closer to the mechanism. Um, and this correlate, and to some extent, it can correlate with what's been found out experimentally. I have a paper under review 
that I did with Falk Hudig and uh, Jenny Aldring mm -hmm. on prediction in processing. Yeah. And uh, the there's been a lot of research on prediction lately, and people always phrase it in sort of Bayesian terms. Yeah. And I find this a little hard to understand biologically. I don't think the brain is computing priors and computing probabilities and counting frequencies over uh, uh, over a six billion word corpus. I don't think that's the way the brain works. It just doesn't sound plausible. And what we've been able to do is come up with an alternative model that doesn't explain everything, but it at least has the pro the possibility of of uh, brain instantiation if we we're getting you know a little closer. Mm -hmm. I would also love to see more work on spatial representation. Um, I've been urging everybody I know who works on vision to think about it, but I think the effort really died with David Marr in 1980. Um, yeah. to really have a theory of the representations as opposed to the processing. Yeah, you, 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 you brought up nicely, uh, Biderman and Mar. I, mean, I, I, I don't think now we see a lot of resurrection of these ideas in, in, in vision. Of course, we have a lot of computational approaches and a lot of brain data, but how the brain perceives objects uh, in terms of components and, and your relationship to language. I mean, I'm not pretty clear I any time to understand the connection, but uh, yes, these ideas are not uh, as disrupting more, probably. Which is right. I mean, the, what has really taken hold, I think, is this, is uh, all the deep learning. Yeah. And I just don't think that's the way people learn. I mean, it may give you results, but it is not. It's I don't I don't think. <laughs> Let's see my, my instincts about how the brain works given what I know about psychology and linguistics, is that, that deep learning is not a model of what's going on in the brain, although it may give very impressive results. All right, I think uh, uh, we could take some questions from the audience. There probably are some questions in the... Uh, Ray, could, you, could you see the, the chat box here? There is a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and if the audience okay. wants, they can ask something precisely to set time and we already have taken more time. Yeah. Let's see what we got. Thank you, but interesting context. Is there a major difference between the logical syntax that a computer language follows versus the conventional language, say English? If so, is it an advantage or a disadvantage when it comes to knowledge acquisition and intellectual development? Well, I don't know whether it's an, this comes back to what I was just saying. Um, there is a major difference between the logical syntax that a computer language follows versus what's going on in language. Um, computer languages don't have phonology. They don't have a huge number of words except that people construct them. Computer languages are not sort of learnable by two-year-olds. Um, the formal properties of Computer languages, at least as I understand them, I'm you know many decades out of touch with computer with with programming. I did it back in the 1960s. <laughs> that doesn't count anymore. Um, people working on theories of meaning that, uh, let's say, the formal semanticists are working on principles that actually. Uh, um, have the same ancestor as computer yeah. language, right? Um, so, and I don't think formal semantics of the of the Montague grammar sort or the model theoretic sort. Again, I don't know that they have much to do with psychology. You ask a um, philosopher, a logician, what does this have to do with the way we think? And they say, it has nothing to do with the way we think, it's just logic. So there's this disconnect between um, logical languages, logic, logical syntax, computer languages, and uh, the way brains work. And I, you know, I would hope that someday we figure this out. I don't but, know if that. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? Uh,
everybody is stunned. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, you could. Uh, All right, so I oh, think oh, somebody is asked, okay, how the interface and relational links can be implemented in bilingual representation. That is coactivation patterns at phonological morphosyntax and conceptual level, levels cross linguistically. Do you think there are different processes operating in bilingual and monolingual representations? Good. We've addressed that a little bit in the texture of the lexicon. Um, you have to have a lexicon for both languages for, or for each language if you're talking about bilinguals, but you have to mark them somehow as to which language they belong to. Um, so that's, if you like, an, another very, rather trivial level of representation in the uh, lexicon, namely for each word and each syntactic construction, which is now also in the lexicon, um and every idiom you have to have a feature that says this belongs to language one or language two um now how that plays well it's how do i want to put this it's interesting because it gives you a little bit of a purchase on the difference between language and dialect because if you take dialect, two dialects, you want to say, well, much of the lexical information does not carry a feature that says what it belongs to. It belongs to either one. It's neutral. But then some, some of the principles of, let's say, phonological realization or certain words or certain syntactic constructions will be marked for which dialect they belong to. And now we can make a smooth transition between being two languages or being two dialects, just how much is neutral and how much is marked. And that seems to me to be correct. Uh, that is, if people say, what's a dialect versus what's a language, they always say, they throw up their hands and they say it's political, right? So there's the famous quote from Max Weinreich, right? A language is a dialect with an army and a navy, okay. yeah. right? Um, so the representation doesn't put the, the two languages in different parts of the brain. Um, it puts them all together, but you, you, if you're talking in one language, you're making all of the features line up. If you switch languages, you're now picking out a piece of structure from the other language and you continue using structure from the other language. Um, if, oh yeah. Um, and when you activate words in one language, the synonymous words will be activated in the other language as well. So you deal with this business of inhibition. So how do you keep the other language from intruding when you're speaking? So it gives us a, a way in the represent uh, to talk about what's happening with the representations um, that that sh that yields uh, the kinds of behavior and experimental results that we find with bilinguals as well as dealing with this business of what constitutes a language versus a dialect. So I think we're on the right track. Um, whether that, you know, how this develops over time, I don't know. Again, it's not my, uh, I've covered a lot of things, but not that. Somebody else in the chat? No, not yet. Ah, is all of morality based on culture? Whoops. Is all of morality based on cultural context or is there something like a universal morality? Uh, this is a big philosophical issue. Uh, yeah. The philosophers want to typically want to say there are absolute moral, um, uh, absolute principles of morality. But then if you look cross-culturally, you find exceptions to almost everything. Um, so as I mentioned, slavery is okay in some places. Sleeping with your mother is probably all right in some places. Um, certainly, the the kinds of things that you're who you're supposed to show respect to, who counts as your relatives, those kinds of things are, are variant. 
And so what I think one can say the same things about uh, 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 principles of morality that one says about principles of language, that there are sort of meta principles that say, here are issues that a mor moral system has to deal with. Now you have to learn how your culture deals with them. The same way as universal grammar says, you expect a, to be hearing a language with phonology and syntax and semantics. Now go out and find out how your, the language in your neighborhood does it. I, but, uh, I think any, any universal morality would be very uninteresting. <laughs> you know, well, <laughs> if that is how it is. <laughs> right. Um, okay, next is, sorry if this is a naive question. Do you think there are individual differences in the form of the language of thought? Some people report that they think in pictures, other report thinking in words and sentences. Why do you think those individual differences arise? Um, I certainly think there are these differences. Um, I don't know why they, I don't know why they arise. Uh, my overall view is that people's brains and minds differ sort of the way their noses and fingers differ. That it's, you know, there's some biological variation that results in. Um, the other thing is probably with respect to language, there's some people who are more analytic than others. So some people who see a lot more structure in the words and more and other people just memorize the more of the words. Um, and again, we can talk about that in terms of your sensitivity to building schemas and so forth in the morphology. Um, what's interesting is that it's very hard to notice that those individual differences exist until you start doing experiments. Yeah. More questions? Mm, we are pretty... Uh, I don't see any questions so far. The audience could, uh, could ask using mic as well, if uh, you, you feel like one or two questions we could take. Uh, otherwise, I think we should uh, be happy to, to, to stop here and Thank Ray for his uh, very kind acceptance and all what we have learned from him. And I'm quite sure that many people would uh, be interested in pursuing these ideas in their own domains. And that's why we keep doing this program so that irrespective of the fields that you are in, you would like to broaden them. And uh, so thank you again. And uh, uh, it's an honor to speak to you personally and to have you on the show. Well, and thank you for having me. And if you think of questions down the line, feel free to email me. Um, and uh, I hope this has been entertaining for your evening. I hope so. And uh, uh, we uh, an edited uh, version of this video will be uploaded on the University of Hyderabad's official YouTube channel. Uh, there you also, those who could not join us would have a chance to have a look and they could uh, write to Ray uh, if they have any questions or comments. Um, so with these words, uh, we would like to close it here. And uh, please join us for another uh, interesting episode. On 27th, uh, we are hosting Jerry Altman, uh, another psycholinguist of repute. Uh, and thank you, Ray, again, uh, uh, really, in this uh, difficult time for interesting times as well. So that's yeah. You know, it's a virtual in, virtual presence of you in India in, in some way. Okay. Uh, and we'll be happy to host you. Maybe things change later, but fingers crossed we go. <laughs> All right. Anytime. All right. Thanks, All right. everyone. And I thank the students who have been involved in organizing this uh, and the, the computer aspects of it. And it ran pretty, pretty well. Uh, there has been no issues so far. And I look forward to your participation in future programs. Thank you.